So we are an iron channel CRO, we're a management buyout from our old company, so we, we took the, the biology group and, the, uh, and all the equipment, including a couple of key patches, and we're now on the Bay Ruhan Research Campus here in Cambridge. So we have a, a broad range of iron channel services. What I talked about before was just the, was just the cardiac safety panel, so just the in vitro assays, the human cardiac iron channels. What I'm going to talk about today is the phenotypic assays using the stem, human stem cell cardiomyocytes. So is there a crisis in cardiac safety? Well, I think um, Buzz gave a very good background on the issues that have got us to this point. Perhaps we're trying to now solve, and we're very close to solving any potential crisis. But the, the big issue, of course, was, was cost and a, a poor success rate in a way. We didn't have any drugs coming to market that had uh, um, arrhythmic or torsogenetic risk in the last few years but it was very expensive to filter all of those out. So it's a one million pounds per thorough QT study. There's an awful lot of in vitro screening with the HERG channels. And, and that's not always a good predictor of risk, as, as Buzz pointed out. We've got some compounds that actually do block HERG, but are not arrhythmic, and so they are, in fact, safe in the clinic. And vice versa, we've got a lot of positives hits in, in HERG that are now killing off a lot of very good chemical scaffolds from the drug discovery screening cascade, and that's not necessarily a good thing, and it certainly is very wasteful. Um, so we're, there's, a, there's a, a convergence, I think, of thinking and, and science from pharma and biotech and CRO, and also regulatory bodies, to now use a mix of in vitro, ex vivo, and in vivo assays for cardiac safety. And what's really important, and this is obviously where Safarin come in, and other platforms are available, of course, is with the screening of the human uh, cardiac ion channels. Currently, there is a lot of use of ex vivo and in vivo animal models, and there was a question, I think, from Thomas Jesperson to Buzz, do you still think there's a role for animal models in preclinical testing? Yes, there is, and I'll give you an example of why that is still the case. But to try and make this process more efficient now, we're introducing human stem cell cardiomyocytes to try and remove some of the vagaries in the animal-dependent, species-dependent issues of preclinical uh, testing. And finally, the FDA has got involved. There's the HESI Institute, there's the CIPRA initiative, and so I'll give a brief overview of what that is. They're trying to bring this together and have a much more efficient, cost-efficient uh, system for screening for cardiac safety. And some of you do already know what CIPRA is, but we've had a few questions from people in the audience, and they don't really, they still don't know what, what CIPRA is, because you're not involved in cardiac safety, maybe you're not involved in iron channel drug discovery, or drug discovery per se. So it's the Comprehensive In Vitro Proarrhythmia Initiative. It's coming both from the US and from Europe and from Japan. And it's trying to have a combination of in vitro and in silico models. So we see here, there's a three part thing. These are the, others is talking about buckets. So these are the three buckets of uh, CIPA. So human ion channels. So we're, we're getting screening data from these panel of uh, cardiac channels. We're then feeding that uh, IC50 or in vitro potency data into in silico models of uh, human action potentials and some people are also such as at ESI now have very nice in silico emulations of the human heart so they have virtual ECGs so they can look directly at uh, changes in QT. So we'll have the in vitro data, we have the in silico data but that's still indirect, that's still all very in vitro so we really want to have some sort of a firm basis, a phenotypic a functional assay and this is where the stem cells come in. So the predictions from the silico models should be tested. The plan is to have them tested in IPSC cardiomyocytes. And so the predictions here of arrhythmia or not should then be reproduced by the various readouts that are possible from human stem cell cardiomyocytes. It's important to note that the readouts are still not decided by the FDA, and there's a whole range of platforms that have been used. Electrophysiology here, multi-electrode array imaging, so uh, Clyde Bryant sciences using their voltage-sensitive dyes, Vala, where are you, Rob? Well, there you go. Vala, using uh, calcium dyes. Uh, we're also using impedance uh, measurements. So it's a very interesting science. It's a really fascinating science. And Metrons has only just got involved with this this year. And it's been a real eye-opener for us. But it's been really great science. And we're getting exposed to new techniques. And part of talking about it today is to have you be exposed to some of the new techniques and new science as well. So those are the three parts of SIPA. I'll just talk briefly about the first part. So why these ion channels? Why not just HERG? What, how do we come about this list of six or seven, depends, hemocardiac ion channels? So they're all ventricular. And the evidence for this, of course, is twofold. There is 
a genetic link for all of these channels causing arrhythmia in torsades, and these are the LQT mutations. The first one here in KCNQ, um, HERG, NAV 1.5, CAV 1.2, so that they're, they're, they are genetic mutations, channelopathies that occur in the heart that cause uh, changes to the QT and changes to uh, cardiac risk. So we're showing the inward currents here in black and the outward potassium currents in red. And here you see this lovely schematic that many people have stolen many times over. So these are the inward currents and these are the outward currents. Uh, Herg here. I hopefully will remember to talk about the two different sodium channels. So there's the peak and then there's also this persistent current which comes on a little bit later. There's some interest in this as potentially being another important regulator of cardiac arrhythmia. Uh, there was a poster here from Axiogenesis where they're looking for the expression of the late sodium channel in stem cell cardiomyocytes, human stem cell cardiomyocytes. And there's al always also the story of uh, renalazine as a selective blocker in those targets. Mm -hmm. So we've got genetic evidence for all of these channels being important, so therefore that's why they're in the SIPA list. And there's also, of course, the drug-induced um, problems that you see with many of the blockers of HERG, but now we're seeing that there are some other examples. And we'll, we'll go back here to KCNQ again, uh, IKS. So there's a famous story from J&J, &J, your past life, <laughs> where they were developing uh, blockers. Like, it was not for cardiac, but it, it turned out that they were very potent and quite selective blockers of uh, IKS. They looked perfectly fine in the old school in vitro um, cardiac safety um, screening cascade until they got to the dogs and then all hell broke loose and there were some major issues there and they didn't know what was driving it so they had to go back and open up the box and try and find out where it was causing this effect. It turned out those compounds were blocking KC and Q. So this is the core panel, HERG, NAV and CAV, but we certainly need some of these other ones and the, the experience of J and J is that, and, and from modeling from ESI is that KC and Q is very important. That should be the fourth of the SIPA channels and then maybe we also need to be looking at KB43 and CUR2.1. HCM4 seems to have fallen off the list. <coughs> Oops, am I going up or down? So this is an example of the key patch assays that we have for these, the SIPA panel cha of channels. So HERG, KB43, NAV15, KCNQ, CUR2.1, and HCM4. So the second part, we've got the assays, we're generating the IC50 data now on QPatch or other platforms, and we're feeding them into the in silico models, but we need to use those predictions in stem cell cardiomyocytes. We need to test them. So this is something that Metrium was not working on until this year. We're part of a, a, a Eurostars grant with an academic collaborator at Leiden and uh, Nanian Technologies, you see, this is completely impartial, uh, but other technology companies are available. Uh, the role here for this grant is to look at academic and commercial stem cell supplies and, stel and their iPS cells to develop uh, assays and different screening platforms and techniques to have, to be able to offer phenotypic assays that are capable of translation to the clinic, so being able to predict actual human cardiac risk. And this is the new part for us is using the iPS cells for that. So the, I'll just give a brief overview of our, of our methods. So there's a, a team working with uh, patch clamp electrophysiology. Um, current clamp recordings are spontaneous and evoked uh, action potentials using perforated patch. And we also uh, make recordings of ionic currents using conventional wholesale recordings. So this was a movie, but I'm not going to play it because it doesn't work. Uh, but this example of a patch recording of a, of a cell in an IPS in a beating syncytium of uh, cardiomyocytes. And what we see from different cell lines is quite different rates of spontaneous beating, different shapes of the action potential, and importantly, different durations of the action potential, the APD. So we have software to automatically extract these parameters from the action potentials. This is an example from these four cell lines giving these different APDs. You see one cell line is markedly different from the others. These are all very brief, even though these are supposedly ventricular. But having different beat rates is not good for doing comparative pharmacology. Some compounds are rate dependent, some channels are state dependent, so it wouldn't be fair to, to match a, a use of state dependent compound on this, and this spontaneous speeding with that spontaneous speeding. So we prefer to use evoked action potentials, and this way we get a truer representation and comparison of the different shapes and APDs. Uh, so here's the resting memory potential that's measured just here before the stimulus artifact. We've got the action potential amplitude here. 
We've then got various measures of action potential duration, APD 20, APD 50, APD 90. And you'll see this particular cell line has a low resting potential. It therefore has a, a more shallow, less intense uh, upstroke of the action potential, and it there also has a lower peak amplitude of the action potential. But these other three cell lines are, are broadly similar in terms of their resting potential, their speed of depolarization, and their peak amplitude. But you do still see differences in the action potential duration. So which of these is more ventricular? Well, we don't know, but they're all supposed to be ventricular. What's interesting for us is that some of the cell line supplies are actually being quite upfront about the mix of atrial-like and ventricular-like cells in their preparations. So this is a schematic from Axel Biosciences, who are also here in Cambridge. This is data from Ma uh, using the CDI I cells. So they're these slightly briefer action potentials that they're calling atrial-like and then these broader ones in the ventricular like. But in our opinion, we think just using action potential shape is a little misleading because this atrial action potential looks a lot like that ventricular action potential. So we'd rather start using pharmacology and obviously ion channel pharmacology. And to first look at the atrial versus ventricular, you have a very nice review of the ion channels and some of the selective atrial ion channels from Thomas Jesperson. Uh, and he talked about a couple in particular, KV1.5 or AKUR, ultra rapid, and also the GERC or the G protein coupled inward rectifier IKCH. And we have some selective tools. We found that 4AP is actually a relatively specific blocker of KV1.5 <coughs> channels versus other potassium channels. And this is data from our Q patch assays. So this is KV1.5 in the presence of 4AP. This is KV4.3. So there's about a 50 fold, maybe more, selectivity here. So we use a low concentration of 4AP, and we see a broadening of the action potential in the ventricular, ventricular IPS cells. Well, that's not right. Uh, so they have a touch of atrialness about them. Inter and we see this in multiple cell lines. Interestingly, we've never seen a response to a GERC blocker, so tertiary Q is an IKCH blocker. So it has some atrial channels, but not all of them. So it's a, still a bit of a mixture. And obviously, we need to feed this data back to the suppliers so that they can make their populations more ventricular-like, and, uh, and also we'd be able to identify populations as being atrial or ventricular based on pharmacology rather than just on shape. So we've looked now with the evoked action potentials for the general sort of cardiac ion channel pharmacology. Uh, they are sensitive to TTX. We mostly see here a slowing or a delay in the upstroke of the action potential, which is shown here by the purple bar. We also see uh, a broadening of the action potential in the presence of the L-type blocker uh, nifedipine. So the calcium channel should be active around here. So this is where we see the broadening in, in APD 20, 50, and, and a little less so in the APD 90. Um, TTX, so this is, we think, NAV 1.5 because it's TTX resistant, but it's not completely TTX resistant. It is actually blocked by between 5 and 10 micromolar TTX, which is what we see. What's really important, obviously, for cardiac safety is do these cell lines have Herg sensitivity? And we do see this, and here, of course, is one of the it's fairly selective blockers. So 550 and 500 nanomolar dephetylide produces this, this characteristic broadening of the action potential. Um, and occasionally, in some cell lines, we also see this um, delayed depolarization or after depolarization, this EAD, which is very characteristic of uh, cardiac arrhythmia. What was interesting when we look at the effect of 50 nanomolar to fetalate in various IPS cell lines is that they don't all have the same broadening of the action potential. So some have more HERG than others. As a reference, there's some data from Anabios in San Diego who've been doing recordings from native human tissues. So they have patient donors uh, and they're making recordings, uh, sharp microelectrode recordings from the tubercular. So this is with, I think, 100 nanomolar to fetalate and they see 100%, like basically a doubling of the APD. So this was a, just a comparison to try and see where our IPS cell lines. So they're getting close to the native human situation in some cases, and that's obviously what we want to see. Question is, is that too much of a difference? Are these IPS going to be a little less sensitive to her blockers? Um, we don't know yet. So this is still very much a work in progress. We've been given more and more time to validate the IPS cell lines by the FDA. It looks like we've got now until the end of next year to do this. Um, so switching from current clamp to voltage clamp, we're also interested in looking at the underlying ionic currents that are producing this pharmacology of the actual potentials. 
Uh, so we, we obviously see sodium and calcium. We see a different amount of sodium and calcium in different cell lines. So this is the current density of sodium channels in gray, calcium channels in green. And then if we look at the ratio of the two, uh, this is the purple bar. So these two cell lines are fairly similar. This cell line is very different. It has a lot of sodium channels. It obviously has a very fast upstroke. Is this physiological or not? Is this an imbalance? Is this perhaps more like the mature situation in human cells? We've still got a lot of work to do for that. Um, and to corroborate what we were seeing with the action potentials in terms of the sensitivity to a KV1.5 blocker, we now apply the 50 micromolar 4AP to the potassium current, and again we see this reduction in the ultra-rapid, the IKUR, the transient outward current. And when we look at the, we see this in most of the cell lines, IPS cell lines we've looked at so far. And when we look at the relative ratio of transient outward and sustained outward currents, two cell lines are fairly similar here, and then there's another cell line that has a lot more outward current. But this is actually the same one that also has a lot more inward current, so it's just got a lot more current. Um, but they're balanced out, so therefore that might give you a physiological response. And finally, we're seeing some evidence for, we're calling it an inward rectifier. This is an inward current elicited by hyperpolarizing steps. This could be HCN, that's hyperpolarization current, uh, but these currents are blocked by barium, which is a bit of a signature for, uh, for, for CO2.1. So we think that there's a small expression of the inward rectifier. This is very important for setting the resting membrane potential of these cell lines. And some companies are apparently trying to modulate the expression of this channel to, to, to make the, the IPS cells more mature. So we're very happy that we get able to detect this in the cell lines we've looked at so far. Um, so the final part is, of the talk, I've just got two more slides left, I'm not sure how I'm doing for time, we're good, is the in silico modeling. So we're taking the data from the in vitro assays, for example, from the QPatch or other platforms, and we're being asked to put this into various models of A, of the action potential, or of the cardiac risk. So we can look at the, the general preference seems to be to putting the data into action potential models, but I'll, in my next slide I'll talk a little bit, I'll refer a little bit to what um, Buzz was talking about, that there are other ways of modeling cardiac risk and ion channels. Um, but the traditional way is to use these various in silico models. So these are the three main models. It would seem that uh, the FDA is uh, more impressed with the O'Hara Rudy, which is a simulation of the human action potential. Uh, we're looking here at the various, the, the virtual pharmacology of these models. Uh, O'Hara has a, a greater Herg sensitivity and is also able to generate EADs, which we know is, uh, is pathophysiological. Uh, this particular model has way too much sensitivity to KVLQT1, for example, and this is just another example of a Herg blocker. You would expect the Herg blocker to prolong the APD. It has no effect in the Tentushin model, and it actually has the opposite effect in the Grandi model. So this is why O'Hara Rudy is preferred as the in silico model for, by the FTA. But other methods are available to model cardiac risk. And as uh, Buzz was talking about, that, they, that the multi-ion channel effect on mice has been pioneered by the scientists at Chantess, and they're using logistic equations to actually model the risk and to, to look at the differences between arrhythmia and tercetogenesisy. Um, so that's an alternative to using action potential simulations. And there are now other methods of doing this, which is in terms of machine learning algorithms. So these algorithms are trained on a data set where you have the known free plasma concentration of drugs. You know that some of those drugs cause arrhythmia and some of them don't. And so you can teach the machine, teach the algorithm, and then when you put similar data in from test compounds, it will say, well, we think that could be torsinogenic or not. But this, it's a very binary readout. Um, we looked at, uh, previously we've looked at an online web portal that has a, a human action potential simulator. This is from uh, Gary Murren's lab in Oxford. Uh, there's another one now called EasyAP, which is also available online. It has somewhat similar effects or outputs, but it only uses um, three, the core panel. It doesn't use all five or six of the preferred human cardiac ion channels. And we see with the full panel you get EADs and you also get active but delayed repolarization. What we see in this minimal model here is you you don't really see in the AD, this is really just a partial repolarization. So if you're comparing the purple trace and the purple trace here, which is one micromolar of, uh, I think it's a stenozyme. And there's also this machine algorithm, which is the cardiotox predictor. So there is, we're not sure what the pacing is, 
pacing is very important for modeling cardiac risk. We're not quite sure what the model is. Uh, it's a very binary output. Um, and both of these other uh, options here, you have to subscribe to use those services. The one run by Gary Murins is free because it's open source. It would seem that the FDA is going to decide to go down this route and they're going to want everybody to use the same model and that model will be made available online and you won't have to pay to use it. So it kind of, unfortunately, cuts these other guys out of the loop. Uh, but it makes it easy for everybody. This is the part of the standardization of SIPA. We want to have standardized voltage protocols. We want to have standardized solutions. And we want to have standard methods to analyze that data and to uh, test those predictions in the stem cell cardiomyocytes. So we're slowly getting towards where we need to be with SIPA, but it seems that there is still quite a long way to go. We think this, the actual in vitro data is coming pretty close now. There's an HDS sub-team that many, many of us are a member of where we're going to be testing those standardized protocols on various automated patch plant machines. We think that the in silico modeling is now fairly standardized and the number of the different sodium channels, or ion channels are going to be standardized. Um, but this is where all of the work is right now, is the, the stem cell cardiomyocytes. There's a lot of different readouts, a lot of different platforms, a lot of different stem cell populations, and that's going to take at least another year to sort out, and that's what a lot of us are still actively involved in. Um, but this is the really interesting science, because this is human cells, and this is trying to model what happens in the clinic and to try and, in the end, have more efficient drug discovery and also to save lives. So that's a certain high motivation for all of us to aspire to. Thank you. Oh. Sorry, yes, acknowledgements. The, these are the scientists, some of whom, whom are in the, in the audience who, uh, who participated in this work. And we also had funding from the Eurostars European Consortium. Thanks, Mark. Questions for Mark? Thomas? Thank you very much. Very nice. So, the vivo cardiomyocyte sits in an environment that will allow the cell to stimuli. What about the iPSCs? Have you tested for the GSGI uh, regulatory mechanisms? And or do you see them? I'm, I'm not aware of, of anyone process. talking about that. I mean, the, the milieu, the intracellular, the extracellular milieu, the, the mixed uh, phenotype of cells, no. I mean, people for a long time have been striving to have very pure populations of just the cardiomyocytes. It seems now there's a realization we might have gone a little too far. We're stepping back, having cardiac fibroblasts, having other cells. We're going from 2D to 3D. But in terms of people looking at, I mean, my focus today, our focus is just on iron channels. That's not the only driver, not, not the only target for cardiac risk. There's, there's cardiomyopathy, there's the structure. So other groups are looking at the, the other aspects of the physiology, the cardiomyocytes. But in terms of, yes, other signaling, um, I'm not aware of, of people looking at that or testing that at this present time. So what about the simple isoprenaline GS activation, I guess? Um, that is one of the, the tools for people, that's one of the people look, look, we're looking for effects of isoprotonol in these assays, but we're not having it in there all the time. Same with acetylcholine and muscarinic activation, and GERC, et cetera, et cetera. Mark, you see a variation in the action potential duration when actually the frequency in the different populations. You set up a set of criteria for each batch before you use uh, at the moment, no, we're, we're exploring right now. Um, we have experience from the past when we were attempting on what um, native human cardiac tissue looks like, but quite often that was diseased tissue, so it's actually quite good to, quite important to be getting data on um, normal, like sinus rhythm, and non diseased uh, ventricular tissue. And that's quite hard to get access to that tissue and, and see records for that. Um, I mean, the basic question is people will say, well, normal human cardiomyocytes don't beat. They're not spontaneously active, so we've already dug a huge hole for ourselves here. Um, the shape we think is very qualitative. We think the pharmacology is going to be much more crucial. So I'm glad you touched on the beating part of cardiac stem cells beating autonomously. Uh, what about the stem stem state of these cells? And are these are you, are you making IPS or? No, I'm, I'm a, I, which a caveat, I'm an electrophysiologist, and in fact I'm not a cardiac electrophysiologist, I'm a neuroscientist. But is it, uh, so, are, are these IPSs from adult cells IPS? Or yes, adult? they are, uh, to my knowledge so far, the, the cell lines that we've looked at are generated from, from 
adult IPS. So you've already touched on the variability that some of them may be able, some of them may be equivalent. What, about, what are the quality controls to establish that they are actually retaining their standards rather than becoming reflexive? I, I, I don't know because I'm not involved in that process. So you would, you would assume that we don't want them to be to retain much standards. So this, this is the terminal differentiation, and we actually want it, this to be to be the end point of the of, of the process. The the mixture of atrium and ventricular, you could say this is each cell has a little bit of atria, but mostly is ventricular. Or you can also look when you look at molecular mark as well, 87% are ventricular and 13% atrial. Ventricular. But it's probably not true. It probably is a, a, a hybrid. Which gets to the nub of the point, whether they are fully differentiated or whether some of these cells are halfway through. I, I don't think they're ever was. going to be fully differentiated. And I don't think the stem cell um, engineers are actually they realize they can't be saying that. That's why it's still important, just as it's still important to involve preclinical animal models, it's still important to validate all of these assays with native human tissue where and when you can get them. Although both these statuses could be quantified and sort of measured in terms of what type of gene expression, <coughs> protein expression is there, and you have some measure to say these are differentiated and these that, are that data is available on all of the batches, each of the batches that are made by both the academic groups and the commercial suppliers that we use, yes. And that they have their own QC parameters before the cells are sent out, and some of them also include electrophysiology, they might run them on MEA, and might be electroarray, for example. So that's another issue, is not only getting them to a state, but making sure that they're consistent from batch to batch to batch, because this is going to be for an entire industry.